in this time to pastor for the message today taken taken from x 13 verse 26 to 30 the god guy Thank you, Ed, for an awesome time of worship. Being able to worship God with songs is a tremendous privilege. Privilege for us to be called to worship, and it's also a joy to see all of you here this morning, and for those of you who are able to join us over Zoom. No better way to be able to spend Good Friday morning in His presence and with gratitude, gratitude in our hearts, to just to remember what He has done for us on the cross. Topic today is God die. Did God die? We know historically, yes, Jesus died. There's no doubt. But was he God? And that seems to be like a no-brainer. What kind of question is that, Pastor John? We can all say yes, and let's all go home. But I think it's more than that. If God really did die, our lives will be different. The way we live our lives should be different. So, did God die? So, before we look at the passage, let's look to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that this morning. We could be found in your house, having this privilege to worship you with songs, and also right now to be able to worship you by opening to your word, so that you can speak to us. And truly, it is our heart's desire to hear your voice and your voice only. So this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to us in a special way, so that we'll walk away from this place a different person, one who is changed to be more like Jesus. And truly, that's our desire, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. No one would dispute that there was a man called Jesus who lived some two thousand years ago in Jerusalem, and this speaks to the historicity of Jesus Christ. That means he's a historical figure, a real person. Who occupies time and space like us? But you and I would occupy time and space for probably thirty, sixty, ninety, maybe a hundred years. Then we are gone, out of here. And if he's a truly a historical figure, that is why the world over observed Good Friday for the last two thousand years. And again, no one would dispute that Jesus was crucified on the cross by Roman soldiers, 
And again, this speaks to the historicity of what Good Friday is all about. But the only thing that we can dispute are the claims of Jesus. And amongst the many claims he made, one stood out. It is the claim of Jesus that he is God. Jesus claimed to be God. And if Jesus is truly God, how then can God die? Maybe the correct question is, why? Why would God die? Was he nailed to the cross? Yes. Did he die? Yes. He, he died buried in a tomb. Did God die? The Apostle Paul, on one of his missionary travels, was in a city called Antioch in the province of Pisidia, which is today southern Turkey. And while he was in the synagogue on one Sabbath morning, Acts chapter 13 tells us what happened. And we'll be looking at the passage from verses 16, beginning with 16, so as to give us some background. Acts 13, beginning with verse 16 to 31. But I will just read from verses 16 to 20. <clears throat> verse 16 in the NIV translation reads, Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. So beginning in this passage, and in verse 17, Paul tells us the historical beginning of Israel, beginning with the ancestors of the Israelites. But notice here in this passage, he was also addressing the Gentiles. You and I, we are Gentile, or most of us are Gentiles. Beginning with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Paul gave us a historical summary from the time Jacob's 12 sons came out of Egypt and followed by another 40 years in the Sinai wilderness and to the time Joshua and the Israelites occupied the land of Canaan. All this took about 450 years. The Israelites were able to occupy the land. And this passage will tell us only because it was God. It was God who destroyed and removed the Canaanites from the land, that God had 500 years earlier promised to give to Abraham. 500 years earlier, God already promised to give the land of Canaan to Abraham. 
And again, all this were not only factual, and, and they are also historical. Both the people and the events, they are all historical. So, after Joshua died, and the second part of verse 20 continues. Verse 20b reads, and I'll read to you verses 20 to 22. Verse 20, the second part reads, After this, God gave them judges. And judges are not like our high court judges, but they are military rulers, most of them. People like Samson, Gideon, and so forth. There were quite a few of them. Not all of them were good. But God gave them judges. Because there were no kings. And there were judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, notice the word removing. Who removed Saul? It was God. It wasn't David. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. That means concerning David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Again, it was God who placed David on the throne. And God said this of David. I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. The description, he doesn't say of any other people. Definitely not of me. I don't know about you. A man who will do everything God wants him to do. Now, David wasn't perfect. Far from perfect. But there was something special about David. He loved God. And he obeyed God. That, is, that was why God used David in a very special way. How? The Apostle Paul continues to tell us. Verses 23 to 25. Acts 13, verse 23. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John, that's John the Baptist, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I'm not the one you are looking for. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Before Jesus was born, John the Baptist was born a bit earlier. He was really the cousin of Jesus, but they didn't grow up together. So he doesn't know Jesus very well. But when John the Baptist went into the ministry, he started to announce to the people of Israel that the Savior they were waiting for, the Messiah, their deliverer, is coming. And that he is also God. The God who became man. And again, all these that we've just read, they were also factual and historical. We know of Samson, we know of Samuel, David, and John the Baptist. They were all real and historical people. From the descendants of David came 
the Savior, the Messiah that was prophesied. The, the Israelites love to think of him as also the deliverer. The deliverer who is, who is going to chase out their Roman oppressors. And all this was prophesied in the Bible. And in verse 26 onwards, we're told that this message of the good news of the coming of the Messiah the deliverer was given to us. And in verse 26, Paul continues. And he addressed them again. Fellow children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. Verse 27, the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate, to have him executed when they had carried out all that was written about him they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb so here which is the passage for today paul said four things he started out by saying the message was already given to us. But the people of Jerusalem and their rulers, their religious rulers, the Pharisees, did not and were not able to recognize Jesus. But the truth is, they refused to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And they condemn him by bringing in false witnesses. And then they got Pilate to execute him on the cross. And all this was prophesied. And having been carried out, when all the prophecies were fulfilled, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. The religious leaders knew, knew fully well that Jesus was the Messiah because everything that was written in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And they knew, knew fully well because all the writings of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books, they call it the Torah, was read every passage, every book. All five books were read, were, were read out in their synagogues on every Sabbath day. Interestingly, that's how they did it. The whole five books were all divided into 52 or 53 passages. And it was systematically read on every Sabbath. That's why Paul here can say that they were read every Sabbath. And yet, knowing and having the Torah, they refused to acknowledge Jesus. And then verse 30. It's a good news. Jesus died, buried in a tomb. But the story didn't end there. Verse 30 tells us, but God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. 
And for many days, he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. Verse 31 says, for many days, he was seen by many people. So the question is, how many people? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6 tells us that after that, after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. More than 500 people who were eyewitnesses. And at the time of Paul's writing, many were still alive. They would have contradicted Paul had it not been true. Jesus rose from the dead. On the third day, we call it resurrection. Jesus resurrected, as scripture had prophesied that he would. So having seen this, we have a good historical background leading up to the crucifixion. And if we pick up, if we're to look at this passage carefully, we can pick up four key words from verses 26 to 30, 26 to 30. And those key words, they are all highlighted in blue. The first word is message. Second word is Jesus. The third word is executed. The last word is raised. From these four key words, we have four historical facts. Four historical facts. The first one is the message. The message of salvation. The second word is Jesus, who is the Messiah, because he came not just to deliver the message, the good news, but he also came to deliver us from the bondage of sin. He is the Messiah. The third word is executed, which is murder. They murdered Jesus because he was innocent. The last word is a miracle. A miracle happened. He walked out from his bridge. And as we look at these four words, we're going to break it down and take a look at what does it really mean? What does it mean when we call it the good news, the message of salvation? It is the message of hope and deliverance. And you may ask, why would I need hope? Why would I need deliverance? And the reason is this. It's because God said that we are all sinners. Meaning, we have been living a life of rebellion against God. And God being holy and just, He must punish sin. And we're going to go to hell. But because Jesus loves us, he came to bring us the good news of forgiveness. How you and I can find our way back to heaven when we die. Jesus being fully God and fully man. But he never ceased. To be God. He never stopped being God. He merely gave up his powers when he came to earth as a baby and he lived amongst us. Here we have an amazing picture of God 
becoming man. But as you look around today, it is the opposite. It is man trying to be God. And that has never stopped since the time of Adam. We have got Nimrod trying to be God. And today, not too long ago, we have Caesar. They are all dictators. They made themselves to be God. And in our world today, we see many strong men trying to be God, trying to live forever. But you and I know that is foolishness, stupidity. The clock will get you. The clock will get us too. But here, God can become man and Jesus remained fully God and fully man. And while Jesus was here on earth, Jesus did three things. Three things. He told us all about God. <clears throat> about heaven and hell. And how we can be in heaven if we only believe in Jesus. And then he showed us how we too can live a godly and obedient life that he expects from all of us. And finally, he died. He went to the cross for our sins. Why? How can that be? It can only be because Jesus was the Messiah. He can die for us because he was the Messiah. Jesus being God, because he loved us, he was willing to take our place and he willingly took our places on the cross. Should have been us. But when Jesus came, Acts 13 verse 27 tells us that the Israelites, the people who had the Torah, their religious leaders, did not have a clue when Jesus came. And when he came, he told them they refused to believe in what he has said and all the miracles that he had performed. In spite of more than 300 prophecies that we find in scriptures, and all the miracles that he had performed, they refused to believe. And today, it has also become our responsibility. We will be held accountable. All that Jesus has said, if we don't believe it, we will be held accountable. And proven by all the miracles that he has performed, we too will be held accountable. For that reason, Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites. You brood of vipers. Jesus called them snakes. And I think the worst part is Jesus called them children of the devil. So today, if you're not a child of God, you're a child of the devil. Nothing in between. Nothing in between. Choice you have to make. That's the choice you have to make. And that made the Pharisees mad, really mad, because of what he called them and what he had exposed them to be. Religious leaders who are really servants of Satan. And then we find many people starting to follow Jesus instead. And the only way to silence Jesus 
was to kill him. And they had him murdered. They had him murdered. They brought in false witnesses to accuse Jesus. And then they forced Pilate to make a political decision to get rid of an innocent man. But all this happened just as scripture had prophesied to. There were a lot of prophecies. And today, if you and I, looking at all the prophecies, and if we don't believe, there's nothing more for you. Prophecies, the life of Jesus, and the work of Jesus on the cross. And how can Jesus, one man, be able to die in our places? And scripture tells us that only a sinless man can die for another sinful man. Because if Jesus was a sinner, then he himself deserved to die. He need to die for his own sin. Just like today, we are all born in sin. And if your sins are not forgiven, you and I will have to pay for it ourselves one day in hell. But Jesus was sinless. And we call this the doctrine, the teaching of substitution. The doctrine of substitution, where one man who's innocent can take the place of another. And Jesus qualified because he was, he led a sinless life on earth. And he became the sacrificial lamb of God. Went to the cross and he was buried in a tomb. And all this were factual and historical. And that is why we observe Good Friday. And it has been done for the last 2,000 years. He died on the cross and was buried. But a miracle followed. Jesus rose from the day, on the third day, showing that God has accepted his sacrifice, the sacrifice of a sinless man on behalf of the sinful world. And Jesus said that if we only believe in him, we will become a child of God and go to heaven to be with him when we die. This promise, we see that in the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you only believe in his name, what is his name? His name is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is God. And if we are to believe in that, he gave us the right to become a child of God. So we ask the question, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Many of us would say, I believe in Jesus. What does it mean? How do I become a child of God? Or in other words, what must I do to be saved? And this is the message of salvation. What is the message? What is it all about? And I like to say that the message of salvation, the gospel, the good news is as easy as A, B, C. A is for admit. You have to admit that you're a sinner. 
a sinner that deserves to be punished in hell. But Jesus loved you and died to take the punishment on your behalf. So that if you believe that Jesus is God, if you believe that Jesus is God, and this God became man. And interestingly, when Jesus became man, he did two things. Firstly, when he came to planet Earth, he lived a sinless life and he told us all about God, all about who God is, what God has done for us. And finally, Jesus told us how God wants us to live our lives by surrendering, by submitting ourselves to his control. That is how he wants us to live our lives. Who is God? He's the creator God. He's the almighty creator God. And what has he done for us? For the Israelites, God constantly reminded them that he is the God who brought them into Egypt and then he brought them out of Egypt. He redeemed them at the Passover, which is quite similar to the Good Friday, Passover. And then he delivered them through the Red Sea. That's what he did for the Israelites. And that's what he did for us too. He redeemed us on the cross. And he has delivered us out of the hands, out of the bondage of sin. And today he's telling us how he wants us to live our life. By surrendering 100% to his control. But that's our problem. It's hard. If I were to ask how many of you can surrender 100% to God, I'd better put down my hand. Some may be 5%, some may be 30, 35, at best 65. I wouldn't go any higher. That's how and that's what God demand from all of us. And if you truly believe in all this in your heart, if you truly believe all this in your heart, then the second part is he went to the cross and he died. These are the two things he did when he came. And if you truly believe in all this, that he rose again on the third day and is coming again. Then you can move on to the last part, the C. The C is for calling out. You call out to Jesus. You invite him into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. Meaning from today onwards, you must follow Jesus in obedience as a disciple, as a disciple. But if you do not believe, what Jesus has said, or the many miracles that he has performed, then you have already rejected Jesus as God. You have also rejected his love for you when he went to the cross for you. Because only Jesus, the blood of Jesus can give us forgiveness for our sins. A sinless man dying for me, a sinful man. And if you reject Jesus as God, you will not be able to find forgiveness for your sin. And the Bible says you will have to spend eternity in hell, away from God. Because in life, 
you have rejected him. You didn't want him to be in your life or anywhere near you. So your wish is fulfilled. You will spend eternity away from God in hell. Some of you sitting here may say, Pastor John, I'm not rejecting Jesus. I'm merely keeping my options open. We've heard that many times, and I'm sure you, you too. You may not be choosing anyone, but you have chosen self. You have chosen self. You are going to rule and run your own life. Nobody is going to run your life. Nobody is going to tell me how I live my life. That's what many, in fact, all of us are saying today. Nobody is going to tell me how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to live life as it is. This is what it means. You have chosen self. Or some of you may be saying, but I believe in Jesus, Pastor John. But I also believe that there are other ways. I don't want to take sides. I don't want to offend anybody. But you already have. Because you have rejected the person who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father. No man can come to God except through Jesus. That's what Jesus claimed. So you cannot have Jesus plus something, something, something. No. It is either Jesus or nothing. And the third one, third response, I think is the most ridiculous. And I've heard it before too. I believe in Jesus. I like to believe in Jesus. But let me ask my father first. Let me ask my wife first. Since when did you ask your father when you, you're choosing your own girlfriend? Since when did you ask your wife when you wanted something? The truth is, you need to decide. Your father cannot take you to heaven. Neither can you take your wife to heaven. You have to choose. And if you do not choose Jesus today, you have already made your choice. You have already rejected him. And you and I know that the world that we are living in today is so very wicked. And God says it will be destroyed very soon. Jesus himself said one day he's going to come again and he himself will destroy all the wicked people. Not with a flood, like the last time. But this time, our world will go up in a great ball of fire. And you know what I'm talking about. It is, it's been a possibility for the, mass, the, the last many, many years. We have got nuclear warhead that can, get, that can burn the whole world over many, many times. It is a possibility. And it will happen because this is what God has prophesied. It will happen. But before he comes, there are signs of his second coming, we call it. And there will be wars, earthquakes, famine, diseases. Things that we are all too familiar with today. Because we are experiencing the virus pandemic, more will come. We are experiencing wars, not just the one in Ukraine. Many parts of the world today are at war, just that we don't hear it. Everything, everything that Jesus has said in the Bible is not only true and historically accurate, but it will happen very soon. Jesus is God, and he died to pay the penalty for our sin. Can I urge you, can I plead with you, 
to believe in Jesus. And you will not only have eternal life and be believing in heaven with Jesus, but you will also have an exciting and meaningful life right here, right now on earth. This world as we know it today will be destroyed by God very soon. The clock is ticking. And again, I urge you strongly to choose Jesus today because you may not have tomorrow. And if you breathe your last, And if you're still living in rebellion toward God, you will stand before Jesus. And you're going to have a conversation with him. And he's going to ask you, why, why would I need to let you through heaven's gate? Jesus is our only hope of finding forgiveness for our sin and making it to heaven. The bad news is this world will be gone. There's no hope for this world. But the good news is there is a new world coming. And everything that the Bible has said has come true and will come true. I hope that you will choose Jesus. But for the rest of us who have been Christian for many years, do you really believe that God died? Because if we really do, our lifestyles, our values should be different our lifestyle and our values would come in line with the lifestyle of Jesus and the value of Jesus. But the big question is, is it? Now again, I'm not asking you to sell your house and go and live in a tent somewhere on the highway, expressway, by the side of the road. I'm not asking you to do that. Face Jesus today and ask him what he wants you to do. There are many things that is wrong with our lifestyle. Churches are dying. Are you dying? But God did die. And if Jesus is God and he truly died, what would he expect from me and from you? He expects us to die to our old self and start to live for him. I hope you'll do that so that the next time we meet again next year, you and I can truly say, I have died. I've started to be like David, a man after God's own That's all that we all want to hear when God can say that of me and you. Let's all walk in obedience to God, living in these last days so that we can make a difference to the world we live in. God bless.